till nine. All right. Well, we're recording now, so that's that. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> we can we can, we can record some chit chat. So. Okay. All right. There you are. <laughs> we saw you. Oh really? Oh, mm -hmm. oh now that's interesting. I hadn't thought. Um... So I had my yeah. <laughs> you know, That's kind of cool. Actually, you know, in some ways, maybe I might I might do this at the beginning because the only thing I find actually I find the webinars sometimes are a little strange that you just have just yeah. the, you don't have people you have voices yeah. Looks like I have a halo there, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Position better with the light.
Beautiful. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our, um, our this month's talk webinar. These webinars are monthly, and the purpose of these is to foster the global happiness and well-being movement that Lester, myself, and several others who are on the call and uh, um, about 850 other people launched this April um, at the United Nations. So we're very pleased to have you here. I'm going to send put in more information on future talks on the chat so you can link into there. This is very much of an inclusive process. So if you're interested in giving a talk or being part of this movement, um, this, these talks are part of other efforts where we have um, twice monthly calls to work together to launch and to foster this global grassroots um, happiness and well-being movement to transform our society and our economy. So my name is Laura Musikansky. I am the executive director of the Happiness Initiative and I'm very, very happy and I've been looking forward to this talk so much to introduce Professor Lester Kurtz, who is the professor of sociology at George Mason University, where he teaches social movements, conflict, um, comparative religion, um, and so it's doing some beautiful work on nonviolent communication, um, working in peace as well. So um, I'll, um, I'll give more to Lester to introduce more about himself, tell more about himself, but just a little bit of logistics. Um, the way that this works is we do about half an hour to 40 minutes of, 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 of Lester talking, of learning, and then we'll have some question and answers um, time. So there's three ways that you can ask questions or make comments. One is that you can raise your hand where it says attendee list. You can click on your name and raise your hand. The other is you can type in questions. And the third is that you can chat. And when we come to the question and answer period, I'm going to try to unmute you so we can hear your voice. If you don't have a headset, it may cause a very um, ugly sound system happening, in which case I'll immediately mute you and we'll need to go to question and answer. All right, so without further ado, um, welcome, Lester. I'm turning, I'm muting myself. Really happy to have you here. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me. I appreciate being able to have this opportunity to speak with folks. And uh, this is very exciting for me to be involved with and talking to people uh, about this idea of trying to create a new economic paradigm that's based on happiness and well-being. Um, and in fact, I think our current our current paradigm in the world is is based primarily is driven uh, to a large extent by profit, and we need to find ways of uh, reframing that. So, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, just real uh, sketchily uh, some ideas that come from uh, my understanding of of social movements and how they work. I'm a sociologist. I teach uh, public sociology at George Mason University, just outside of Washington, D.C., and I've done a lot of study of social movements, especially nonviolent civil resistance and uh, looking at Gandhi's uh, legacy. So I always, I always start with Gandhi and kind of use him as a model for how to bring about some kind of change. And part of what's, to me, really uh, uh, 
extraordinary extraordinary about Gandhi as a model is that he operates uh, on on all different levels from the uh, personal even interior he he changed it he changed himself uh, changed the world and so he moves from this micro level to macro level uh, kind of analysis so as I see there's sort of three steps here one is to listen secondly to analyze and third to mobilize and so he begins Gandhi begins in fact with his involvement in the Indian freedom movement by traveling around the country listening to people what are what are the genuine needs uh, are they being met what what needs to be done to uh, to address uh, what people are concerned about in the world and then secondly you analyze the current system what what holds it up what prevents the the current system from uh, providing people with the kinds of needs that they have uh, both personal social collective spiritual cultural and psychological and then finally how do we mobilize uh, some kind of nonviolent civil resistance in the civil society to bring about the tr transformation of the system so if we if we first of all if we, we begin to listen to what's going on around the world we see that the current economic system has really failed it's failed the people of the of the of the planet it's failed the planet itself it, uh, we have massive malnutrition and misery around the world the, the 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 current system as we've organized the planet simply doesn't provide the basic needs uh, for people living here and so uh, probably the best example to me is is uh, child malnutrition we have according to UNICEF we have about 8 million children under the age of 5 who die of malnutrition every year now this is Holocaust proportions this is a real scandal and if we think back uh, about what was going on during the, the Holocaust when the Nazis were were killing Jews um, we, we, we wonder, you know, where were those good people? Where were the good Germans? Why didn't they do something? Well, now a lot of Germans did do something, but there was no mass movement to try to prevent the Holocaust. There were about 6 million people killed during the entire Nazi era. Uh, we have more children dying of malnutrition every year. That should be reason enough um, to, to mobilize a movement to change how we organize things. We also have this incredible climate crisis at the moment. Um, the, the, the planet itself, the ecosystem of the planet is in trouble uh, with the process of global warming, with the endangerment of, of species. Um, and in fact, what's happened in recent years since the, the 2008 economic crisis started in the United States and spreading around the world, is that it's even failing the elites, and so we see um, we see growing discontent all around the world. And it's a real what this what this provides, of course, is a, is a is a window of opportunity. Uh, John Paul Lederach says we should think of conflict as a window, and so in fact, the fact that the system, the current system, is in conflict, provides us with a chance to see through the walls that separate us, through the, the, the blinders that we have uh, to, to, to what can be done. And this leads us to the second point. Uh, the second part of, of Gandhi's model is, is to begin uh, exploring alternative visions of, of what might be done instead of what we are doing. And, and this takes us to the leadership role from Bhutan, this wonderful little uh, country in the middle of uh, um, of the Himalayas, and I wanted to go to a short uh, report on the meeting at the United Nations last uh, last spring, April of uh, 2012, that looks at uh, this whole issue of look trying to create a new economic paradigm. Sustainable development must go beyond economic progress and include also happiness, well-being, and prosperity. 
On Monday, hundreds of representatives from governments, academia, and civil society gather at the UN headquarters to discuss the concept of gross national happiness, centered on the belief that the well-being of a country's people can and should be measured beyond traditional indicators. Organized by the government of Bhutan, the high-level debate on happiness and well-being follows last year's resolution by the General Assembly which asked countries to put people's happiness at the core of growth and development. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon talked about how countries have advanced this new perspective in recent years, as well as the importance of establishing a sustainable development index. We need a new economic paradigm that recognizes the parity between the three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic, and environmental well-being, are indivisible. Uh, together, they define gross global happiness. The debate focused on such issues as wealth distribution and a better relationship with the environment. Speakers also examined the interplay between economic gains and their social and environmental costs. The meeting jump started thinking on the creation of a new development model to be presented at Rio Plus 20 the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, which will take place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, next June. So uh, what we have here is um, an effort to rethink how we organize the global economy. And this idea that comes from uh, Bhutan of uh, uh, the gross national happiness being more important than gross national product. And uh, in fact, we have then, then uh, the General Secretary of the UN taking it also to the idea of gross global happiness uh, to the global level. So we have uh, some new perspectives, for example, maybe perhaps beginning with measurement. How do we measure how well the economy is doing? And it's not simply a matter of looking at these sort of raw indicators of, of uh, production, consumption, economic growth, and that sort of thing. We also have, if we look around and really pay attention, we have uh, grassroots experiments all around the world in how to make the economy actually uh, producing uh, well-being for uh, people in the world. Now we have I think at this moment in history, an unprecedented opportunity for change. And part of this is because of, 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 of genuine revolutions in consciousness levels, in uh, a kind of nonviolent infrastructure, that is the ability to mobilize people to bring about nonviolent change. And of course, information and communication technologies uh, that have really brought us uh, closer together. So the idea of a global village is not uh, just a, 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 an abstract metaphor, but it's increasingly the, the reality of, of where we live. Now, if, if we look back over the last few decades, a lot of really unbelievable things have happened. Now, who would have, who would have thought that we could bring down the Berlin Wall? Who would have thought that the apartheid system in South Africa would would be abolished. Who could have believed that dictators all around the world would have been toppled through nonviolent civil resistance? Uh, all of these systems that we see around us seem to be absolutely um, permanent, but in fact they're not. Um, and we have new ways of going about uh, uh, precipitating change by organizing people to create counterbalance to the sometimes destructive systems that are in place in various parts of the world. And now, from the global perspective, even the world's economic system itself. Now, it seems, uh, it seems a bit far-fetched to think that uh, we could create some kind of, of global movement of citizens, concerned citizens, to, uh, to transform the world's economic system. The, 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 it seemed so formidable, but so did the Berlin Wall, so did the apartheid system. So did each of the dictatorships <clears throat> that existed in, in Eastern Europe and Latin America uh, and other places around the world. 
So the next step after listening to what's going on is to analyze. And here I bring in uh, some tools uh, from uh, the sociology of social movements from the study of nonviolent civil resistance. And I'm going to just run through some of these very quickly. If, if people um, want to ask questions as, as I go through, please feel free. Laura, Laura can see if, if, if you raise your hand uh, on the control button there. Uh, and then we can discuss these uh, in more detail um, if we have time at the end. So I'll start with a, kind of the, the sociological study of social movements. This is something I teach in my classes at George Mason. Um, some of the kind of uh, different approaches to looking at social movements involve how do people uh, mobilize resources, how do they identify political opportunities, uh, what kind of framing processes do social movements go through to present their message effectively to potential audiences? Uh, 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 people who might become involved in the movement, bystanders who are observing, the, the, uh, the people within the power structure who, uh, who, who are not um, monolithic, which is not, it's not a monolithic structure because there are individuals within any existing system that uh, have their own free will, have their own ideas about things. And in fact, this is how dictators often fall when people within the system began to have questions, to ask questions about the legitimacy of the regime and, um, and, and, and oftentimes go over to the opposition, sympathize, or they resist in some kind of low risk ways within their positions within the government, for example. Um, <clears throat> then nonviolent civil resistance um, is, is a kind is, is a is a sort of related uh, field now. It's a growing field of, of study. Uh, I'm actually co-teaching a course with Maciej Bar Barkowski at George Mason on nonviolent conflict, nonviolent civil resistance, where we go through this literature which parallels the sociological literature. Uh, it's actually interdisciplinary and draws from the experience and examination scholarly study of, of various resistance movements around the world. And then finally, uh, we want to analyze um, the visions that are being that are being put forth. So essentially what uh, what we're what we need where we need to begin, I think, is to recognize that um, there are multiple sources of power. Power, doesn't just grow out of the barrel of a gun. It doesn't just grow out of the ownership of a multinational corporation. Uh, but in fact, there are alternative sources of power that lie with collective action uh, by people, <clears throat> by, uh, by what uh, Gandhi called truth force, uh, which he thought was more powerful than brute force, uh, the ability to sort of suppress people um, through violence. So the, um, the analysis of, of people power involves looking at the various pillars of support that hold up the system. We'll say some more about that in a moment. And then engaging in non-cooperation with, with those aspects of the system we believe are unjust or destructive. And then mobilizing people to join us in various actions um, to, uh, to bring about some kind of change in the system. Now, part of what's um, <clears throat> part of what's interesting about what's happened in recent years is that this kind of nonviolent civil resistance has really been successful, and uh, it should give us hope that we can create something different on the planet in terms of our economic system by mobilizing people from the grassroots in various localities where we actually live and work uh, in day-to-day -day life uh, to the larger macroeconomic systems that <clears throat> mold and shape the context within which our daily lives take place. There's a wonderful, uh, there's an article in International Security a number of years ago, and now a, a subsequent book published by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan at uh, Princeton University Press last year, Why Civil Resistance Works. And from, I uh, borrowed this slide from Erica Chenoweth's presentation uh, about their study, they have a, what they call NAVCO, a, a nonviolent and violent campaign outcomes database. Essentially what they did is they went back and looked 
at 323 campaigns to bring about change over a hundred year period. And uh, they compared violent movements with nonviolent movements. What they found was uh, really quite remarkable. Uh, during this century from 1900, just over a century, 1900 to 2006, um, more than half of the nonviolent movements to bring about extraordinary change. And this is, if you look at the second, uh, at the, the notion of the third point here, campaign goals, these, these are movements to bring about regime change, anti-occupation or secession. That is, to bring down a dictator, to drive out foreign troops, or to break away from a nation. So these are not minor movements just trying to get a little a new law changed, a uh, new law passed, uh, but to bring about some really massive uh, change within a country. And um, nonviolent movements were, uh, uh, more than half of them were successful at bringing about that kind of uh, dramatic change. Uh, a little over 20% were partially successful. And, um, and about 60% of the violent movements were, were uh, failures at bringing about the, uh, their campaign goals. Now, if we look, in fact, over time, what we see is that uh, violent movements have, be have become increasingly unsuccessful. Nonviolent movements over uh, a period of several decades have become increasingly successful. Now, if, if you're wondering why I spend so much time talking about this, it's because this, uh, this should give us hope that we can bring about the kind of change that we need to. Um, in the end, uh, Chenoweth and Stefan argue that the most, the single most important thing about a movement, the most important determinant of its success, was the ability to mobilize large numbers of people. And so uh, the, more, the more people that got involved, the more likely the movement was to succeed. And mass nonviolent action are also more likely to divide the regime, that is to, to create division within the people uh, running, the, running the, the regime. Um, the main reason why nonviolent resistance works better is lower physical, informational, moral, and commitment barriers. It's just easier to participate. And here you see uh, the, how much more successful campaigns are if they have uh, larger numbers of people involved. Uh, so what does this say to us about mobilizing a movement for transforming the world's economic paradigm? Um, and here I go back again to Gandhi. Uh, resist the old system, begin building the new one that you want to replace it at the same time. So. Um, we need, first of all, some kind of vision of tomorrow. What kind of system do we want instead of the one that we have? And here we have uh, this happiness and well-being paradigm. Uh, secondly, we have to analyze the pillars of support of the current system, and then we have to talk about how to mobilize through protest and persuasion, non-cooperation, and intervention. So let me talk a little bit about um, this kind of strategic planning process. And I would encourage you, uh, to take a look. You can download uh, from the internet a, uh, I don't seem to be able to go to, uh, here it is, it's coming up. Um, there's a wonderful guide to effective nonviolent struggle um, that you can download from the internet. Uh, if you just Google this Canvas core curriculum, uh, it'll show you, uh, you can you can download this. It's actually a workbook for strategic planning for a movement. And I want to give you a sort of idea of, of how this works uh, today, just a kind of brief overview. Um, also bringing in some of these other lessons from the sociological tradition. So we start with the vision of tomorrow. They suggest you look at you know, what, what kind of society do you want? Human rights, civic life, general welfare, the rule of law, uh, how do you do away with corruption? What kind of religious, spiritual life, economics, law enforcement, and so on do you want? And for us, the vision has to do with this new economic paradigm. So let me mention just some aspects 
of the paradigm that's been put forth by uh, people not only from Bhutan, but but then as this idea of gross national happiness has has emerged over time in the last few years, uh, culminating in this meeting at the at the United Nations last spring. Uh, first of all, the idea of happiness and well well being involves promoting a dynamic culture, and this is this is this is uh, uh, differentiated. Uh, because we don't want to, we don't want to have a mono culture at the at the global level. We want to be able to nurture the diverse cultural traditions that exist around the world, uh, nurturing these values, wisdom, and practices of our spiritual traditions, and to also uh, nurture harmony among the various uh, traditions that we've now inherited uh, from the past. Um, the second pillar is ecological sustainability. The, the new economy has to be sustainable. Uh, we have to have a system for effective and equitable governance and management of the natural commons. This not, notion of, of the commons is important uh, because it involves thinking about um, what we all own together, really, the natural resources of this tiny planet that's, that's hovering out in the space. <clears throat> and, um, so we have to find ways of managing the atmosphere, the oceans, fresh water systems, biodiversity of species on the planet, plant and animal species. We have to move toward sustainable agriculture that doesn't mortgage the future uh, in order to have immediate profit at the moment. And uh, sustainable infrastructure, renewable clean energy, energy efficiency, public transit, and so on. The third pillar is fair distribution, um, reducing economic inequities. And this is true both at the local uh, national level and, and internationally, uh, where we have enormous inequality. Uh, this is the one, uh, 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 the, the one clear outcome of the Occupy Wall Street and then global Occupy movement uh, from last year, uh, where uh, people occupied uh, various public spaces around the around the, the globe, starting at Wall Street uh, in New York City, the sort of center of the global financial system, and saying, you know, this is this is this is unjust. This is our system. The way the system is set up now is that one percent benefit and ninety nine percent pay. Um, so we have to improve the living standards of the poor provide an adequate social safety net, we have to limit excess consumption and unearned income, and the phrase that I like, prevent the private capture of the commonwealth. That is, what's happened in the current system is that people are able to, to capture what is really commonwealth, these, the, the natural resources of the planet, the human resources of the planet, uh, and uh, these belong to the community, and uh, we need to find ways of, of, uh, of, of making them serve the common good. The final pillar is the efficient use of resources. And this, and this is a, an, an important kind of concrete first step that a lot of people have suggested for, uh, for a movement to transform the economy. And that is what, by having uh, what are called full cost accounting measures. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I always, I, my mind always goes blurry when I start looking at these things like internalized externalities. But basically the idea is that um, the costs of production uh, and distribution is, um, it doesn't take into account the damage that's done or the costs of, uh, to, uh, to human social organization and well-being. Of the of the economic process. Uh, so the next step is to look at various sources of power. What is it that holds up the the current um, the current system? What are the pillars of support? Um, police and the military, civil service bureaucracy of various governments around the world, the educational systems that we have in place, cultural and religious institutions, the media of course, and then the economic institutions themselves, which includes both business, corporations, uh, 
and then also labor organizations like unions. Then we also have, um, there's an overlap among, among some of these categories, but we have thousands, tens of thousands of transnational organizations as well as local organizations within civil society globally and nationally and locally. Civil society, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, social movement organizations, SMOs at all levels. So one of the things that uh, some of uh, my students and I, students at George Mason University and now some students have joined us from European Peace University uh, just outside of Vienna, um, uh, we're beginning to cut, try to map out what are some of the uh, potential allies uh, for the movement uh, to, to transform the economy. Looking, looking at even these pillars of support of the existing system, um, there are people within each of those pillars who are potential allies uh, for, for uh, a movement uh, for a new economy. So the, the next step is to, to strategize this, the, the uh, tactics, the, to develop strategies and tactics for a nonviolent resistance movement. And uh, Gene Sharp um, uh, is an American scholar, went to India in the 1940s, and uh, he studied Gandhi and the Indian Freedom Movement, and he systematized this idea, began to find historical examples of, uh, he had 198 categories of nonviolent action that could be taken to try to bring about some kind of change. And uh, in fact, this is his work uh, from, he has, a, has one widely translated in, in, in uh, read and used book uh, from Dictatorship to Democracy, which can be um, downloaded from the internet in a number of different um, languages. And he's set up this idea of, of uh, uh, you have sort of a provocative list to stimulate people's thinking. Now, now uh, these ideas have to be translated into local context and situational contexts, uh, as well as, as um, at, at the global level, our thinking together about what can be done because things happen both locally and globally. And what happens at the local level is often st stimulated, or at least the context for what happens at the, at the local level is increasingly uh, determined at the at the global level, the transnational level. So we begin with um, with nonviolent protest and persuasion. How do we get the message across? And he has this list of uh, here's here are some of the examples that he has: personal statements, uh, honoring the dead, processions, marches, public assemblies, withdrawal and renunciations, and so on. And and here uh, to to be more effective. The sociological literature, uh, such as Benford and Snow, I see I, I neglected to give the, uh, the full uh, footnote here that I was start, starting to write when I was preparing this slide for today. Um, Benford and Snow uh, have, uh, have written about frame, the framing process, in which social movements try to frame their message. And they have to address these three different tasks of the diagnostic, what's the problem that we're addressing? The prognostic, what's the solution that's being put forward? And, and then motivational, what are, the, what are the, 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 the motives for getting involved in a movement um, at, at all kinds of levels and all kinds of, of ways? Uh, this includes frame resonance and frame alignment. That is uh, Benford and Snow, uh, Dave Snow and, and Robert uh, David Snow and Robert Benford talk about about how a social movement needs to have a way of talking about their issues that resonates with potential audience. Again, with these potential recruits, adherents, with bystanders, with with uh, the adversary. One of the secrets to Gandhi's nonviolent action is respecting the adversary as a person and always treating them as a person. While at the same time, um, uh, sort of denouncing systems and behaviors that we abhor. Uh, so we need to find ways of having our frame resonate with others. Second, the second step is non-cooperation. That is, um, Gandhi says, you know, no system, no system stays in power except when people 
um, are able to are able to um, obey it. And as soon as we withdraw our power, then the system begins to run into trouble. So we have uh, different kinds of non-cooperation, um, ostracism, ostracism, boycotting social affairs, staying at home, um, things that we're more familiar with, probably economic non-cooperation, such as, first of all, boycotts. Uh, if, we, uh, if we try to, um, to, to mobilize people not to buy the products of corporations that are creating economic problems for their employees, for the people in their uh, uh, in their spheres of influence. Um, the strike, of course, um, used by the labor movements. We have symbolic strikes, agricultural strikes. There was an extraordinary um, strike that was carried out by the Danes after the Nazis invaded them in World War II, they had a two-minute strike every day at noon in which everything just came to a halt for two minutes. And what it did was uh, it enabled them to avoid uh, arrest. It was a kind of what we call low-risk tactic. Uh, but it showed the widespread discontent with the Nazi occupation. Uh, political non-cooperation. Gandhi encouraged uh, Indian officials of the British government to resign from their positions. Uh, people can also, instead of resigning from their positions, they may uh, engage in reluctant and slow compliance, um, where they uh, uh, try to they go they go about doing their work, but the work just doesn't uh, get done. And then finally, uh, nonviolent intervention. And this is a maybe more dramatic or radical um, step. And my guess is that there are, there are probably points as this movement progresses to try to change the economic structure that we'll see uh, the need for some kind of nonviolent intervention. We had uh, on, a, on, a, on a microcosmic level uh, in the American Civil Rights Movement, um, sit-ins at lunch counters where uh, there was a, uh, a legal segregation where, where um, African Americans were not allowed to, to be served or to come and ask for service. Uh, and by, by having young people, black and white, come and sit together at these lunch counters refusing to leave, they were arrested. And a movement was born that helped uh, through careful strategy and tactics and planning uh, to bring down uh, the segregation, the official segregation of the system in the American South in the 1960s. Of course, we have uh, here this wonderful uh, photograph at the top of Tahrir Square, where uh, the Egyptians demanded the resignation of Hosni, Hosni Mubarak uh, in, a, in, in, in a move that uh, dramatically that surprised everybody. Now, that change is not yet over. They're still struggling to create a new nation, uh, uh, but even the fact that Mubarak resigned uh, was an extraordinary sign, and I don't think Egypt will be the same again. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we have a picture of the Occupy, Occupy Wall, Street, Wall Street movement in this frame of, of looking at the 99% and 1% that I mentioned before. So, so if we begin to think about um, really tangible steps that a movement to change the global economic paradigm might take. Uh, we can start with one of the first things that's happened is we have the United Nations declaring March 20th, the International Day of Happiness. It'll be a day to educate and celebrate. We're trying to uh, encourage people all around the planet to have some kind of event wherever you live. If you can organize an event, um, that, and there will be a website that uh, has resources and, and guides, but, but people can do whatever they think is appropriate in their own location. And then another kind of tangible step that may be helpful for this movement, I think, is the idea of some kind of national measurements of pressing for change in how the economy is evaluated on an annual basis so that we uh, move away from uh, simple measurements of gross national product and begin to look at things um, 
uh, such as uh, Bhutan has done, where they've set up a, 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 rel a sophisticated uh, measure that's now also being explored by other countries around the world, uh, where we look at where we look at um, you know, the uh, sustainability issue. You know how how has the environment fared over the last year? What's the level of inequality? What are the level of levels of education, uh, of healthcare, uh, and so on? Some of the kinds of things that have been explored. This is not entirely new. We have things like the Human Development Index, the Peace Index, and so on. So people have already begun to recognize um, the limitations of of the gross national product uh, narrow way of measuring things. Uh, so let me uh, let me stop. Uh, there and uh, turn it over to see if there are questions and comments that people might have. Beautiful, thank you, thank you, Lester. Um, so now is the time when you can go ahead and you can um, ask questions. And there's, as stated before, there's a couple ways that you can do that. You can raise your hand. So if you see the attendee list, you'll see your name, and you can just raise your hand, or you can type in a question. Um, in the question, or you can type in a question in the chat. So I'll go ahead and get it going. Um, Lester, would really, I'd really love to hear from you um, what you think the next step needs to be around the Occupy movement, and how does that work with the happiness, um, with the happiness movement? Uh -huh. uh, that, that's a that's a very interesting question. I I think the um, what what the Occupy movement did was to enhance. Uh, People's consciousness. It actually it actually changed the national discourse in the United States, the political discourse around economic issues, uh, to a to a considerable extent. And um, what what the what the Occupy movement, um, the the real failure of the Occupy movement is so far. We have to remember it's only been around for a year. Uh, was that they they had a very limited strategy. Uh, that is, they were organized. Almost uh, entirely around this one tactic of occupying a particular geographical area. Now, this also made them immediate, um, immediately vulnerable to attacks uh, by the by the police. And so, uh, the the main the main problem that that, that, the, that the movement faced uh, in that instance was um, this this problem of. Uh, of uh, Limited tactics and strategies. Now, the the movement itself has um, been experimenting. The Occupy movement has been experimenting with other strategies and tactics, such as uh, helping people who who are being moved out of their homes, uh, who've lost their homes through uh, foreclosures by the banks, and so on, um, and uh, addressing uh, specific economic institutions, especially banks, um, and I. And I think, um, although although the movement has not been visible in the news, um, there has been a lot of uh, transformation going on, and and some creative thinking that was sort of spurned by that movement. Now it seems to me like uh, one of the things that we can do um, is is if we think of the the this happiness movement as as we've been calling it. Um, as, as I think a kind of enabler also of, of other movement because it's really it's a kind of hybrid movement we're trying to bring together um, lots of different movements first of all there there are um, things like the Occupy movement there are peace and justice movements there are religious institutions educational institutions labor movements various of various sorts all around the world that are working on some peace and justice issues Reducing inequality, seeking for justice, looking at the links between war and injustice, um, finding ways of bringing about legal change of, of, of engaging in civil disobedience when there are uh, moments of, of, of a sort of gross injustice. Uh, even the infrastructures of, of, of human rights, uh, from the rec reconciliation commissions to the International Criminal Court, which are kind of different models for how you address. Uh, abuses of human rights. Um, so we have we have that kind of cluster of peace and justice movements. And there's also uh, the uh, this enormous collection of environmental movements around the world. And 
so part of what the this happiness movement, the idea is that it is I think to sort of foster communication collaboration among uh, these movements that have been working on different issues uh, that are actually interconnected and interdependent. Uh, but sometimes we tend to work in our own specific areas and think of them as as, as being disconnected from other from other places. Um, then um, it's also a hybrid, is a kind of hybrid movement in the sense it's it's grassroots, it's bottom up, it's we're trying to get in touch with people. Uh, around the world. This is one of the things that some of my students have been working on is looking at who are some of these allies. Um, for example, there's a, a yearbook of international associations that has tens of thousands of organizations working on lots of different issues. So for example, one of our students, a young woman from uh, Lebanon, who's at George Mason, is uh, doing a search of organizations in this annual yearbook um, that say they're working in the areas of human rights. Uh, so let's begin to map these out, look at where they are around the world, find out what they're doing, and begin to connect them. So we have this, some of the kinds of advantages that the Occupy movement had of framing the issue of saying, look, 1% of the world is benefiting from the system and 99% of us are paying for it. Um, and, then, um, and then kind of moving beyond that to a much more uh, uh, sophisticated and a rich texture of strategies and tactics that we can engage in. Great. We have a comment um, or a question from Thea. So you're unmuted, Thea. Go ahead. Thea? Oh, um, I was interested in just bringing up the conversation for all groups something that they already know, which is, does money make you happy? Um, and then to maybe stimulate the question, uh, how much do you need to be happy? Okay, okay I'm going to go ahead and mute you back again. Yeah, so, um, so um, Buster, if you wanted to re reply to that. Thanks, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And I think there's been some good research on this that, that shows uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on, on this, uh, the happiness research, but there's been a lot of it. Uh, um, and I'm just beginning to read about it myself as a consequence of having gone to the meeting at the United Nations last spring. Um, so I've become sensitized to it. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it does look as if, it, uh, you need certain basic needs covered. Uh, so, so your happiness goes up as you make more money until you reach a certain level where you have enough money to survive. And then um, beyond that, it becomes um, a matter of if you're, if you're spending your time making money rather than spending your time uh, with, uh, with your family, with your friends, it's, it's, it's really probably these networks of friends and social support these are the kinds of things that make us more happy. And so there is some good, actually some good evidence um, that suggests that uh, sort of just accumulating wealth uh, has a really limited effect on happiness. Great, beautiful. All right, so Lorna has, um, Lorna, I'm gonna unmute you. Go ahead, Lorna. Lorna, are you there? Lorna? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute Lorna again since she's not coming in. So her questions are, what are the specific vulnerabilities of the current economic, economic system and how can we practically use it to the world's benefit to change it nonviolently? And I just want to add to that question, um, um, Lester, if you could answer sort of the, you know, those of us who are actually doing the work um, mm -hmm. at a very um, lo local-based place. So, um, you know, you know, doing it in our in our communities in our neighborhoods, and the, and I add to that this dilemma of we're trying to do the work to change to transform our, from our economy, but how do we get the resources to do that um, when most of the resources are accessible through money? So mm -hmm. that plus you know this idea of the the specific vulnerabilities in the current economic system, how do we address those and use right. those nonviolently? Right. 
Uh, very good. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I mean, part of why we need lots of different people uh, trying to do the analysis is that, is that, like, I'm a sociologist. I tend to look more at uh, macro level issues, uh, and a lot of the answers come from from um, micro level uh, uh, analysis and what people are doing in their local communities, what people are doing in their own lives, what people are doing with their families and friends uh, and neighbors. Um, so, so let me well let me start with with um, if we look at the vulnerabilities of the existing system. I think that the immediate the, the most obvious thing is that. Um, we have at the global level what the Occupy movement was talking about at the at the at the, uh, at, at the national level in the United States. The 99.1 uh, percent difference. Gandhi used to say, you know, there are 350 million Indians and 5,000 British, and the only reason why the British are able co to control us is because the Indians just go along with the system. And uh, so th this is essentially what's happening with the current economic system. That is. Um, we have we have a we have a system that's skewed in one direction, and money flows in a certain direction. In fact, it flows you know to places like my own country, the United States, um, because that the system was set up. Current system was set up after the Second World War, when the world was in shambles. The United States uh, had had resources Europe didn't have. Europe needed American money to build their economy. Japanese. The Japanese needed uh, aid to rebuild their infrastructure, and so the United States basically kind of made a deal, uh, although it was a, an unequal deal, um, because they said, you know, everybody said yes, sir, and they signed on the line that, uh, for example, um, American currency, the American dollar, would be the medium of trade. So if if you're in if you're in China, you want to buy oil from Saudi Saudi Arabia, you have to use dollars to buy that oil, uh, which of course is a fundamental uh, aspect of the existing structure. Now, if you look at what's happening today, um, there are challenges to that hegemony of the dollar in a lot of different quarters. I mean, the European, uh, the euro has become a medium of, of trade among European countries. It's no accident that that's one of the first things that they did. Um, and um, there's um, this coalition of of countries. I don't know a lot of the details, um, but but I, I've heard uh, about the, it's called the BRICS. It's Brazil, India, China, um, Korea, South Korea, Russia. Sorry, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Korea, and now South Africa has been added. Uh, so these are major players in the world um, economically outside of the the EU and the United States, outside of the Western countries plus Japan, that have dominated the, the, the kind of global economic structure uh, in recent decades. Um, but they comprise a major portion of the world's population. I mean, India and China alone uh, comprise more than half of the people on the planet. And so... Um, there's a there's a kind of this I'd say this is where the vulner, vulnerability begins in the global system um, where people uh, recognize um, for some it's obvious uh, you know people like uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan who comes from a tiny little country that's that's kind of wedged in between uh, these um, uh, th these uh, Major powers, India and China, and um, so so we have this kind of this kind of re rebellion in a sense. Then at the at the local levels all around the world, people can see the inequalities in their neighborhoods. Um, they can see the um, they can see the the kinds of problems that are created by uh, lack of food, lack of education, the kind of cumulative discrimination that occurs. From uh, childhood, from children not able to get an education, a proper education if they live in a poor neighborhood, uh, not getting proper health care, not to mention uh, the the problem of malnutrition. Now I've got I've gone on uh, uh, a bit too long on this, but but I think we can look around us 
um, in our neighborhoods and, and, and in the globe and see um, a lot of dissatisfaction. And I'm not even convinced that the people at the top, that, that the 1% are that satisfied uh, with their lives. Many of them are trapped in jobs that completely consume them and don't, don't give them time for, for friends and family. Thank you. A nice, beautiful answer. Um, does anybody else have other questions? Because we've got time for one more question. If somebody else would like to, um, okay, I have I have another question. Um, in in sort of the the recipe, it talked about you know the ecological sustainability, but a lot of the science is saying is that we're we're headed for a potentially irreversible ecological crisis. Right. So my question is around um, how do how do we, um, you know. It, how do we transform in crisis, um, you know, thinking a little bit about um, paradise built in hell and, and what is the role of adaptability today and, and in the future and how can we leverage that? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I remember years ago, I taught a course in the early 1980s at the University of Texas on the, the nuclear threat. Uh, because at that at that time we were we were concerned. A lot of us were concerned that you know with the increased tensions in the Cold War and uh, the, the, uh, is this incredible system of destructive technology uh, that we were going to have a nuclear holocaust. And I remember a student coming up to me after class one day and she said, um, "You know, do you really believe we're going to be able to prevent a nuclear war from happening?" And I said, "Well, I don't I don't know, but in the meantime." I'm going to do what I can to prevent it. And uh, if the bombs start falling, at least I'll, I'll know I did something, right, to try to keep it from happening. So, you know, this I mean, part, of the, part of the problem with the current crisis is it's in, invisibility, isn't it? Um, even, I mean, this whole framing issue is really, is really problematic because um, it turns out that people don't, people don't really pay much attention to the science that says that this ecological crisis is already, you know, the, it's well underway, it's not something in the distant future. Um, just like the malnutrition, you know, this problem of malnutrition and lack of fair distribution of resources. So we have a whole series of crises of kind of direct violence, structural violence, cultural violence. Um, and this should be enough to get us off of our chairs and get to work. Um, and and now, for me, what's what's uh, what's hopeful is that um, there there are people who recognize this and who are working on this in in every corner of the globe, and um, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of leadership coming from unexpected places, like like Bhutan, for example. I mean, most people have never heard of Bhutan, uh, and the answers the answers may not come from uh, the centers of power. Or even from those of us who live in the centers of power, that a lot of the more creative, essential ideas for how to transform uh, the world will come from uh, places we might not have heard of before. So maybe part of part of the role for those of us who have access to some of the technologies of communication, the sort of uh, luxury to sit around and think about these things and do research on them, um, that 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 part of our job is also then to to sort of give voice to these uh, uh, these voices of people who've been shut out of, of the system up until now, and uh, I I think that you know through there have been three major areas kinds of institutions that have been key it, to to most of the nonviolent movements in the past in the past decades um, religious organizations and and there's there's some sense of this in a lot of religious organizations, a sensitivity to this, uh, to, the, to the ecological and economic crisis and how they fit together. Um, universities, because we have uh, both students and uh, faculty involved in research and in education, and we have students who have this useful energy and ability to act. Um, and then uh, labor unions, are often a key workers' organizations, probably because they're organized and because um, workers often often have a kind of understanding of these issues that 
that, that more privileged uh, people don't have. And they also see the power of organizing. And so I see all around the world there really uh, there's a kind of awakening to these issues. And there's, there's the other sort of major uh, component of this is probably the media. And uh, one thing that's been encouraging to me is that, is that the media, there are, there are pockets of the media, first of all, that have some understanding of these issues. And secondly, now we have our own media. Uh, I mean, even things like this, this webinar is simple and sometimes boring as it might be. Uh, because we don't have all the you know the, the flash the flash and mirrors, but we also have some really creative uh, uh, people at various levels around the world who are involved in, um, in in developing creative ways of expressing these ideas, and I think we can we can we can imagine a lot more of that happening uh, in the in the next few years. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. So I got three things, um, many things out of this, but just want to recap that, um, that part of our role in this happiness movement is to connect the dots, to provide that cohesion, um, that we can be more successful in taking multiple strategies and, and to, to be very mindful of our role in communicating and educating and giving voice. So um, I know there was a lot more in there, but thank you so much, Buster. Um, you. You, um, we'll, we'll put a recording up of this, of this talk on Basecamp, and if you want access to that, just get, shoot me an email. I've I've put my, um, my, my email up there. Also, Lester, if we could get your deck, we'll put that up there as well, um, your slideshow, and then some of the resources that you mentioned as well. So thank okay. you so much. Okay. Our next talk will be thank with, you. yeah, thank you. Our next talk will, will be with Mary Judd of Mary Judd Communications, um, who's been working in Bhutan, who's been working on the movie, distributing the movie Happy, and we'll talk about um, actors in the happiness movement, and that'll be um, next month. Um, so thank you all so much and have a happy day. <laughs> thank you, Lester. Thanks, <laughs>